Good morning from Life Church at South Mountain. My name is Larry Farr. I'm the Bible teacher of the adult Sunday school class here at this church. And we welcome you today as we begin to think about the precious Word of God and what Jesus Christ is to us today. These are troublesome times, difficult times, hard times. They are fearful times. And yes, according to the Word of God, they are perilous times. People would ask the question, well, what, what is happening? Why can't the government, government do more? Why can't the medical field find some antidote for this horrible virus that is sweeping the world today? Where is there an answer? Is there an answer? Is there someone out there whom we can trust, whom we can look to for a solace, for a panacea, for all of the ills that beset us? I have a message for you today that Jesus Christ is indeed the message that you need to hear. And I have a message this morning. It's just a short one, but I think it is a message of hope for you. Somebody would ask the question, well, is this a curse from God or is this a judgment from God? Well, I don't presume to be in the mind of God, and I will not go on record as saying that this is a judgment. It could very well be because Isaiah wrote that when thy judgments are in the earth, then the inhabitants will learn righteousness. This world is sinful, yes, wicked and evil. The nations of this world have kicked God out of their societies. And the only time they want God is when there's a peril that's going on in their, in their midst. But the thing about it this morning is that God could very well be judging this earth. But we will leave that up to him. But the thing about it this day is that I have a message for you. That a message of hope, a message of cheer. And I want you this morning to take your Bibles, if you have them with you, and turn to the 91st Psalm. And I challenge you to every day take this Psalm and prayerfully read through it and trust the Lord in it because I do believe this Psalm is a message for us today. Now, this Psalm is untitled. And the Jewish rabbis believe, according to the Jewish Talmud, that this book is written or this psalm is written by Moses, that he wrote it during the tenth plague that beset Egypt when the firstborn in Egypt was smitten by a, a tremendous plague to those that did not have the blood on the doorpost the death angel would pass through and the firstborn would be slain in the night. And many of the, the rabbis believe that this, this psalm is written by Moses or was written by Moses. And I want you to follow with me this morning. The first verse of Psalm 91 said, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He that wants to be in the secret place with God must abide under his shadow. I'm reminded that a few years ago, I was, it was Christmas time, close to Christmas, and there's, I was in a, a, a department store, and the, the place was packed with people. And I just happened to notice a woman having a little girl, looked like about two and a half or three years of age, and holding her hand and looking up at the people as they were passing, thinking that they were looked like trees in a forest to her. But her mom turned loose of her to take a look at some item on the shelf, and, and the people were passing around, and the little girl took a few steps away, and she looked around and didn't see her mother. And she began to cry, and she cried out, Mommy, Mommy. And her mother came, of course, and said, I'm right here, darling, no problem. But you see, the problem was that she got out from under what we would think to be the shadow of her mother. 
There's a saying that if you don't see the Lord's shadow, you have drifted too far away from him. And what you need to do is to return to him. The scripture goes on to say, I say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Now, this word refuge is, means a place of safety, a haven of rest. And several years ago, I lived in Dayton, Tennessee, and I lived about a mile from the river. The Tennessee River and the Hawassi River came together in Dayton, ten Tennessee, and they formed a large island out there in the midst of the waters. And this was a government uh, animal preserve or preserve for wildlife. And every year during migration, Canadian geese would fly south and then later would fly back north and would migrate on that island. I lived about a mile from that, uh, from that island, and you could hear the geese honking. At one time, they estimated that there were 15,000 geese on that island. It seemed that they knew that that was a place of refuge and no one would bother them. If anyone got on that island with a, with a gun, they would be probably put under the jail, not on, into it, but under it. But the fact is that, that these geese felt safe in that refuge. And there were times, of course, that many of the geese would fly around and they'd see a cornfield and, uh, that belonged to some farmer and they would, they would alight and they would go and pick out the corn and so forth and eat. And, but there were, there were people that were camouflaged and they would take their shotguns and they would kill the geese and they would have goose for dinner that night. If they stayed on the island, they were safe. When they ventured out of the island, then they were imperiled. I, I tell you today, that Jesus Christ is our refuge and he is our strength and he is our hope and he is our guide and he is our help and he will be there so long as we dwell among him, among, with him and among his people. Now the scripture tells us that he will, he will deliver us from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Now, a fowler was an individual who trapped birds, and he sold these birds to very poor people who would go to the tabernacle or to the temple to worship. And in doing so, they, the people would buy these birds, and they would offer them as a sacrifice to the Lord. The poor people in biblical times that could not afford a lamb or a goat, they would buy these birds and would offer them as a sacrifice unto the Lord. You remember and recall that when Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple to dedicate him, that they, they used the birds because it shows their extreme poverty. But the thing that I want to tell you this morning is that he said, he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings you shall trust. I read some time back where there was a wildfire uh, in the state of Texas and the fire just raged across thousands of acres of land and left behind Nothing but blackened, charred uh, remains. Um, an owner of part of the field that had been burned, uh, he went walking out in that blackened area just to, to survey the damage. He came upon a clump, some, some clump there, and he just took his foot and he struck it and it rolled over. But when it did, there were little chicklets that ran out from under that charred mess. And what it was, was it was a mother hen, a prairie hen. 
And she had seen the peril, and she gathered her little children, her little chicklets under her wings, and they were preserved, and they were, they were saved. They, she gave her life that they might live. And I want to tell you today that Jesus Christ gave his life that God's children might live and have everlasting life. Now he goes on, he said, he said, Thou shalt not be afraid by the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day, nor by the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Put that into your heart, that if you will trust in God, it will not come near you. He said in verse 9, Why? Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling. In 1854, Charles Spurgeon was walking down the street, having come from a funeral that he had just preached for one of his parishioners. He had had to bury many of his uh, members of his church because of an outbreak of cholera. And it was devastating. The city itself was shut down. People were fearful to venture out. And he himself was worrying and fretting. What shall I do? I need to be with my people. I need to be with my members. I need to see if they're okay. But I'm afraid that I will get this terrible disease as well and bring it to my family. And while he was musing on that, he, he happened to pass by a storefront, and that storefront had a placard out front uh, inside the window, and it read, Because thou hast made the Lord that is my refuge, even the Most High thy habitation, there shall no evil before thee, befall thee, neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling. He said, That's the answer. And he went about his daily duties, taking care of his people, and God preserved him and his family from that horrible, horrible scourge. Now, I want to tell you today, don't fret, don't worry, because the Lord is your strength. The Bible tells us that fear hath torment, but he that feareth is not made perfect in love, but the Son of God will give victory. God did not let his son come into this world to fail. Jesus did not die in vain. When he died, he made it possible that he would destroy the works of the devil. And today I tell you, in the name of Jesus, to put your hope and your trust in the precious Son of God. And then, as we go on down, and as I begin to close here, the verse 14, heretofore, the writer has been talking to individuals and about himself. But now the Lord himself speaks in the last three verses of this chapter. He said, because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Hallelujah. I tell you today that our God never fails. God cannot lie. And the fact is that he is faithful and that he will do what he promised to do. Have no fear about this virus have no fear about the things of this world put your faith and your trust in the living God who never fails and he will see you through bow your heads with me for a word of prayer father in the name of Jesus today we thank you for your everlasting promise and we thank you today for the precious 
word of God that's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. In the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone that is under the sound of my voice this morning that the hand of our great God will keep them safe from that horrible pestilence. Keep them in your love and in your care. And for these things, we give you all the glory and the praise in Jesus' precious name. God bless you. As we come to you today, I want to jump into the Word of God if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do. If you're there at home, run, grab them real quick, sit down so we can get into the Word and we can see the power of God touch and minister. So with your Bibles open, turn to Genesis, the 50th chapter. And this morning we're going to preach the second part of our message from last week. I'll try to do my best to catch you up as we get into the Word this morning. You see, last week we were preaching about and, and we were going into this, the second part of this message where I spe spoke last week about do not fear to go or don't fear to go. Last Sunday we spoke about Jacob and his relationship when God brought a famine that forced him and his family to move to Egypt. And, and I, I, I've shared with you that sometimes we're, we don't like where we have to go. And, and Jacob was very blessed and he was in the place of blessing in the land of Canaan and God had brought him to that place. But you see, sometimes even when we're standing on the blessings of God, God can move us so we can fulfill His purpose and His plan in us and in this world. And a lot of times we fail to realize that God is in control and not us. We may not like what's going on, but God is able to be in control. I shared with you last week a little bit about how that God had placed His son Joseph through all the circumstances that Joseph had to go through and all the situations that Joseph had, had to face. One, uh, when he was thrown in, into a pit and then sold by his brothers, then moved into a, a Potiphar's house as a servant and then moved into a prison. And, and through all of those circumstances, God used every one of those situations so that his purpose could be fulfilled and his plan would be fulfilled. You see, this morning, we may not understand exactly how that the church is placed in this, but I know that there is a purpose for the church today. If ever before the world needs to see the church be the church, they need to see that it is more than just a building or a structure or a campus that we drive to. It is a place to where we minister and love the name of Jesus Christ, where we touch the lives of those that are broken and where we share the message. You see, there's nothing that can bind the works of God, even though we have the coronavirus and even though we're told that we can't grow, gather in groups of, of more than 10 and even though we, we sit in the circle circumstances we're pondering the ideas I will tell you this the power of God is still alive and still going forward to those who believe and those who are willing to receive you see I believe with all my heart that God wants us to stand as a church today I want to share just a little bit from the place to where we find now ourselves today if you will in Egypt you see I believe that Egypt represents something to us in the Bible Egypt is represented here not as a place of promise but a place to where there was food, a place to where there was a, an opportunity uh, for them to survive. It was a place to where God could bring forth His deliverance. And yet, my message today, we, here we are in Egypt, simply speaks to us, maybe not where we want to be, but in the will of God and the purpose of God and the plan of God. So if you have your Bibles, you turn with me to Genesis, the 50th chapter. I want to pick up my message this morning, found in the 14th verse. Chapter, Genesis chapter uh, 50, verses 14. It says that after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all who went up with him to bury his father. And so the Bible tells us that rather than staying in Canaan where there was a famine, staying in a Canaan where there was hardship and difficulty, staying in Canaan to where all the problems were, they had chosen to move forward and they had chosen to go back to the place of Canaan. Here's what I'm going to tell you, church, is we may not like where we are, but this is where we are. The world is seeing something that they've never seen before. The circumstances like this have happened in the past, but nothing to this level. I believe that with all my heart, God is preparing the church for the last day revival and a last day preaching and a last day outpouring so that we can see the purpose of the church today. I believe that Joseph, when he was, uh, when he was going to take his brothers back, if you will, they had buried Jacob, his father, and it was grieving over the loss of his father. And he asked Pharaoh if he could go back to Egypt 
or if he could go back to Canaan to bury his father where he had chosen to be buried. And he went there and he buried his, his father and came back. And when he came back, he came back and came back to Egypt to fulfill what he felt like was his purpose. He felt like God had placed him there. You see, sometimes we don't realize the purpose. But now, here's the problem. And I want you to look at the next few verses with me, if you will, in dealing with the what ifs. Dealing with the what ifs. Here's where I believe that the enemy plants the seed of confusion and fear in the lives of believers and in the life of the church today. Is that oftentimes we have the what ifs. We don't have the details of what really is happening. We have the belief that God is moving, but we oftentimes let ourselves go to the what ifs, the circumstances, this could happen, this might happen. I want you to look at what Joseph's brothers saw, if you will, in Genesis, the 50th chapter and verse 15. And when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. And so they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying, hold on just a minute here, stay with me. Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive us the trespasses of your brothers and their sins, for, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive their trespasses uh, of the servants of God, your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. He goes on in, chapter, in verse 18 and says, And then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are your servants. When I begin to look at that, I begin to realize that there was something about this what-if statement. This idea that this could be and this could happen. We're running in fear and we're letting the enemy drive us to places of fear. What if we run out of toilet paper? Oh my goodness! Well, I've been talking to a few people and they have a lot of alternatives. Whatever you do with your alternatives, please don't use poison ivy. It can be very painful. There's a lot of different things uh, that we might try to use and we might come to use. What if we run out of food and people are hoarding food and they're grabbing it in fear? You can't even buy many things. I, uh, my wife sent me to the store the other day and I was supposed to buy macaroni and cheese and they didn't have one box of macaroni and cheese. Oh my goodness, the world is ending because macaroni and cheese is not on the shelf. You may not have the things, but many of us stand in front of pantries and cabinets and refrigerators full of food, yet we're panicking because what if this thing goes another week? I know that a lot of pastors that I've spoken to were very paranoid because what if we can't come to our church? What if we don't have the, the means and the money? What if we don't have the money? Let me share this with you. The enemy plants fear by the what ifs in our life. He plants it. What if we run out of money? What if we don't have this? What if they don't pay their tithe? What if circus? Listen, God is in control and God will take care of you. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and He will supply what you have need of today. We understand that the cure for the what ifs are very simple. Let me share this with you a couple things that, and then we'll move on. But the cure for the what ifs is this. The Bible tells us in Proverbs, the third chapter, verses five and six, it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not into your own understanding and all of your ways acknowledge him and he shall, he will direct your path. Whatever you're needing, whatever your direction is, wherever you find yourself this morning, know this, that God is in control. Put your faith, put your trust in God. Don't lean into what you see or what your fears may try to speak to you about. Don't look at that and begin to say, well, if this goes another week, I'll be without this or I'll be without that. Listen, God will take care of it if you put your trust in Him. Amen? So number one, I believe if you're going to cure the what ifs, you need to understand that you trust in the Lord. You put your confidence in Him. Understand that He will be in charge. The Bible tells us also in Mark, the 11th chapter, hear Jesus and you know the story of where there was a barren fig tree. And the lesson that God begins to show His disciples and shows us today is that we must understand and we must realize that as Peter walked up to see this fig tree which Jesus had looked to and went to to pull some fruit off of it and pull some figs because him being hungry. And he went to that fig tree and it did not produce and it was not that season for that fig tree to produce. So there was nothing on it and Jesus spoke to the fig tree and it began to wither up. 
The amazement of the disciples was is that a tree actually listened to the command of God. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of us that have that kind of faith. We're amazed when God does it. We're surprised when God shows up to bring the answer that we need and what we ask Him for. But Peter, in verse 21 of that 11th chapter of Mark, it says, And Peter, remembering, uh, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Have faith in God. Oh, church, if there's anything the world needs to hear, if there's anything that we as individuals need to hear, is that we need to have faith in God as never before. He said, For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt. I've got that underlined in my notes here. It says, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. We will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you will receive them, and you will have them. We don't have to worry about what we don't have. What we do have to realize is what we do have. And that is the power of God working for us as we believe. Amen? It is the work of God and the power of God. It is not enough for us to just say it. it is, we've got to believe it. We've got to trust in God. And we've got to believe with our hearts. When we ask God for these things, we know that He will supply now there are four things that I believe the church can learn about this passage of Scripture that's found where Joseph and his brothers come together and they begin to realize how that we can overcome the fear that the enemy tries to bring to us. Four things that God tells the church and I believe that God was speaking to Joseph's brothers. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant for it good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. He says, now therefore do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. I believe there are four things that God tries to speak to us out of those passages. The first thing that jumps out at me that's very obvious that the church needs to realize when we're in this place where... In Egypt, if you will, where we've gone back to Egypt and we're here in Egypt and we've got to move forward from where we are and where we find ourselves and where the church finds itself today. The first thing we've got to realize is, is that we cannot and we will not and we should not be afraid. Don't be afraid. When, we, when it comes down to it, the enemy tries to speak fear. God is not the author of fear. God is not the author of fear. The Bible says, fear the Lord. And that is the beginning of wisdom. We oftentimes get confused. We're more afraid of the things of this world than we are of the fear of God who will judge the man's soul. In other words, we're more worried about our tangible things than we are about our relationship with God. I believe that that should be the most important thing. The Bible says, do not be afraid. Uh, if you will, in Genesis, the writer writes, and he mentions that twice. Joseph said to his brothers, do not be afraid. And then, if you will, in verse 21, he also says, do not be afraid. The Bible tells us many times over, but I like what it says in 2 Timothy, the first chapter in verse 7. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. So if God didn't give it to us, where did it come from? It came from the enemy who's trying to drive fear into our lives and the lives of the believers because with where fear operates, faith doesn't. And the church is weakened because we have a fear mentality instead of a faith mentality. If there's anything that the church should be operating in, it's faith right now, not fear. We do not have a spirit of fear, but the power of love. Uh, the power and of love and of a sound mind. We should be operating in those three things, but yet we dr were driven by our fears, literally driven to hide and to shy away from the challenges that are before us. Romans, the eighth chapter, verse 31 and 32. It says, what shall we say to these things? Come on, these things that are around us, these circumstances that surround us. What do we say to these things? If God is for us, 
Who can be against us? Is your God bigger than the coronavirus? Is your God bigger than the circumstances that you face? Is your God bigger than the challenges that may come to your finances? Is your God bigger than the circumstances that may operate in your family? I say today, we need to stand upon the promises of God and know that our God is bigger and greater than this that comes against this world today. He who did not spare His own Son but delivered him up for all of us. How shall, he, uh, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I look at this and I begin to tell you that I believe that we need to understand that we are not to be afraid. Secondly, I believe that we are to, we are to realize that we are in the place of God. Joseph said this and as he spoke to these words and he said that, but as for me, you meant evil. You meant the circumstances and Joseph begins to speak about the circumstances of what his brother did and, and it wasn't the fact that he didn't, for, he didn't realize what his brothers had done. He realized the circumstances of what God could do. You see, he realized that he said, I am in the place of God. Wherever you find yourself today, you may not understand completely all that God has for you, but today you need to understand where you are is right now where God wants you to be because we walk by faith and not by sight. We trust in the Lord. We believe in what He is doing and what He promises to do. You see, when we begin to realize that we are in the place of God, we can be used by God. But if we're always looking for something else or doing something else or looking what we used to have or looking for what the, the pleasures of this world or the things that are before us and hoping for the future, we are missing the purpose of God's plan in us now. Many times we think about this that God has divinely ordered the steps of man. God has brought it to be and God will bring it to be so that He can provide the future of where we are. You see, when they came back to Egypt, it wasn't the promised land. It wasn't the land of Canaan that God had told him that He was going to give him, that He would own all of the land and told promise to Jacob, all this shall be yours. goes back to promise to Abraham and Isaac that this would all be yours. God had brought them to a place of Egypt. This may be the very fact and this may be the very time that the church has to realize that we are in the place and we are in the position that God has planned for the church to be. Technologies have opened up and opportunities we're learning. Now listen, I've got some friends of mine that are in the, in the great north and I've got a son that's pastoring in Colorado. And one of the things that they have to do is when church, a lot of times they cancel it because it's snowed in. And, and, and some of you, we have never experienced that, believe it or not, in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you that it'll probably be in the 80s this, this week. So some of you that are crying, we're going to be enjoying a little bit of sunshine. But some of them are complaining where they are because they don't realize God is teaching them with the technology training that when it snows, you can still have church. You can learn how to do these things, and we've learned how to share it. The second thing that we realize is, is that around the airways and around the globe, God is getting His message around and around this world. The, 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 the technologies have developed so that we can preach it and teach it. Right now, we are translating our message and our service into Spanish, and we are doing the, the work of that. We are sharing the kingdom of God beyond our own realm and beyond our single place. God is doing a work. There are people that are tuned in in different locations all over the place because God has the church in a place that it's going to do this last day revival. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt we need to realize that we are in the place where God wants us to be. Not that I speak in regards, Paul says in Philippians the fourth chapter, not that I speak in regards to need, for I have learned in whatever state that I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer. And he says in verse 13, one of our favorite ones to quote, to quote is this, in Philippians 4 and 13, I can do all things through Christ. 
who strengthens me. But in order to know that Christ can strengthen me, I have to learn that in whatever situation and whatever circumstance that I am in, I must know that God is able to do that. I must realize that God has a plan and God has a purpose. That God has a place for me. God has a place for you. And I believe this, we must realize that, that, that God has a plan and a purpose for the church right now. More than ever before, the church needs to know the urgency of the hour. Things are happening, and I shared this a little bit last week, but I will tell you, reading in Matthew, the 24th chapter, reading this week in the book of Revelation, reading in, in, in Daniel and the prophecies that are around us, I, I, I've had people that have texted me and said, do you believe this is the end? And I said, it could happen at any moment. I will tell you this, that I believe it's the urgency of the hour that the church realizes that we are in the business of seeing souls saved. It must be the call of the church to step up and preach the gospel message. It's not time for us to play games or worry about little things. It's time for us to realize that God has a purpose and a plan for His people and to share the gospel message. The Great Commission is something that's not a voluntarily. It's a commission. It's a command. It's a work that God has called the church to do. And God is giving us tools and devices that we can go and preach this message. That they don't have to come to our building. We'll send it to their house. I thought it was pretty cool the other day. Never done this. So I wanted to try it. So I called and I said, I want to have food delivered. The struggle that I had was is that I didn't really know what I wanted. And so when you get online, one of the things you have to realize is if you want it to be brought to you, you better make up your mind what you want before you call. I quickly hung up the phone and they, I, I thought about it and I said, if I want them to bring it to me, I've got to put in my mind what I, one of the things that the church has to realize is that our purpose is to see souls saved. And we may be trying to figure out how to make a bill or how to, listen, we may try to be figuring out how to balance our problems and our circumstances. We may be trying to fix the, the situations around us, but it's about seeing souls saved. And the church cannot lose the priority of it. We may try to learn how to use different tools and different mechanisms, different ways to put structure together, but I will tell you the most important thing that the church can do is get back to the basics of preaching the gospel message of Jesus Christ again, seeing souls saved, discipled, and brought into the kingdom so that we can enlarge this place and do the work. There are, there, we, we may be limited on what we know or how to do it. We may not have enough to be able to put a full staff up here, but I'm going to tell you something when God's in it, He will produce what He wants to produce out of it. You see, God is about saving souls. In 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse 19, Paul says this, he says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. He says in verse 20, that I, to the Jew I became as a Jew, and that I might win the Jew. To those who are under the law as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law as without the law, not being without the law towards God, but under the law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak, that I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Did you... Did you miss that last phrase? Because if you did, you missed it. He says that I might win the weak, that I have become all things to all men. Listen, I am not, God didn't design me to be this beautiful person that's on TV. Uh, God didn't design me. I'm not slim and muscle bound so that I, I'm not talented and, and there's a lot of things that I'm not. But I'm going to tell you something. Uh, this pastor right here is telling you and I hope that you get this message. It's not how beautiful you are to the earth or to the world. It's that you become who you are that you might share the gospel with those around you. And God said, I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. If it means technology has to be birthed, then we'll do it. If it, I don't understand it when my, when my sound man tells me that oh, we got to have a new sound system so we can do things. we got to switch this around. 
I don't understand when my audio visual man comes to me and says, we got to buy a new camera. we got to buy this stuff. I don't understand all those things. But now I look back and I say, thank God that we did that. Thank God that we invested because God had a plan and God sent people in our church that could see the future to be able to have a camera system that we can use so that we can live stream, so that we could do the things that we're doing. Technology, using our broadband and using the internet so that we can do that. God had a plan before we ever got here. I look about this and I say, God, you can use everything. You can use the tools that you've blessed us with. The technologies that you brought to us. These are things that God, you had a plan to use. And God, in all these things, we might see that the most important thing is, is that I might by all means save some. Technology is advancing very quickly. And I'm kind of slow about keeping up with it. But I'm going to tell you something. God brings people in my life that have the abilities God brings people in my life. The other day I was sitting on the couch trying to figure out how to do something and my 17-year-old son came walking in and I was complaining to those that were around me saying, I can't figure this out. He took my cell phone and just a few minutes after he had messed with that cell phone, he said, here you go. I just hate a smart aleck, don't you? But I realize this. If I'm limited, God will send people that have the ability and the knowledge to go beyond where I am. And God will by any means use it. What God's purpose is looking for, if God needs it, He will supply it. Today I will tell you this, by whatever means that God is getting this message out, and by whatever means we must realize that it may not be the, the plan that we had, it may not be what we thought. You see, we've invested in buildings and structures because for the, for the longest time, the church building was what we called the church. But now we realize that the church is more than that. It is us who are living in this place. It is us who walk the, among the people. It is us who deal with this. And so I believe that God has a purpose and a plan. And then finally, if you will, I believe that this is where the church finds itself most expedient today. And that is this. We must reach out to others. Here's what he says in verse 21. And Joseph says this to his, to his brothers there. He says, I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. I tell you, those words mean a lot if you've been to the grocery store and seen the rudeness of how some people have overacted. If you've ever been, I, I, I resemble this fact to... Black Friday, when they hold the doors shut, and then all of a sudden they open it, and people are fighting in the, in the alleyways, and they're fighting in the hallways of the store, and down the aisles, they're, they're beating each other up over the price of a TV screen. Well, now it's even gone to the fact people are fighting over the last package of hamburger in the store, or the last package of, of, of toilet paper. Something that we used to take for granted seems to be. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The church needs to be the church, and we need to learn to love again. We need to speak kindly to those and comfort those who are in need. We need to realize Realize that God has placed the church here so that we can be a beacon of light and of love so the world will grasp the message that there is a God who loves you, a God who cares for you, and a God who will supply for you. We need to realize that God is speaking to us, that He will provide. I like what jo uh, Joseph tells his brothers. He said, I will provide for you and your little ones. Have you ever thought about this? You may not know today how you're going to make it. But my Bible tells me that God will supply. God will take care. And when I come to the end of me, that's when I trust in God. The sad thing is, is I have to come to the end of me. I should trust in God before I get there. But so many times we wait until our faith is challenged, our, our spiritual uh, attack is there, and we come to the place to where we don't understand. But that's when the church needs to realize God will provide. And then we need to reach out in a compassionate way to speak to those. We need to speak to them and let them know that there is a God who loves them. That he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Listen, a kind word will do much better today 
I know the, to this morning we were going through it and I'm stressing out about some things that are going wrong and somebody was doing something, somebody else, and, and everybody kept telling me, boy, you're grouchy today. You're grouchy today. I'm, I said, I'm stressed. Anybody else with me today? I was stressed and I was frustrated and I was speaking out of me. Then I realized when we were doing those songs in the worship and we were worshiping with the praise team, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and he said, you'll do much better if you'll speak kindly and comfort others. And when God speaks to us, he doesn't speak to us to beat us up, but to love us. I don't believe Jesus had to speak harshly to those who were lost. Sometimes we have to speak harshly to the, those who speak and stand in religion because sometimes religion will push us beyond the place to where we are. We need to be the church that we comfort and we speak kindly to those who are in need today. Be patient, be perseverance, because I believe the church and the most vital point is right now. I'm going to ask if Roberto and Naomi would come right now and we're going to close. I don't know. I, I believe that when the Lord spoke this, I believe this message preached as much to me as it did to anyone else. When God was giving me this message that I needed to share it, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. The Holy Spirit began to put in my heart, you're the example. I'll tell you this, church, we need to be the example to this community. We need to take this message and make a difference with it. I believe that God was speaking to me as much as he is to anyone else in this place. Wherever you find yourself, don't be afraid. Trust in the Lord and put your faith in him. Believe on God and believe for what he said he would do. Come to the place and the purpose of what God has called us to be. Not a fearful church, but a faithful church. I believe that we need to understand that God has called us to be that church, to have faith. And finally, I really believe that the most important thing that the church can do is look for opportunities to share the love of Christ. I ask you to, if you would, right where you are, to bow your heads. I'm going to ask you to do this with me. More than anything, I, I want you to pray this prayer. Instead of praying for maybe a need or a problem, would you pray this prayer with me? God, use me. Use me now. Use me today, oh God. Use me, Heavenly Father, at this moment where I find myself in this tragedy, in this difficulties, in these problems, in these circumstances. God, there are those that are sitting by their loved ones hoping that they make it through this. There are those that are struggling with problems and circumstances. I realize that. But God, I pray right now that you would speak to our hearts and speak to our lives. If we truly believe this, that your son is about to come and you were about to take your church home, then let God speak to the church. Speak to your people. It's time that we quit playing games and we get serious again with you, oh God. Help us to rededicate our hearts again to your service, to your purpose. Wherever we find ourselves this morning, wherever we're at right now, God, I pray that you would speak to us, that we would be the hands and the feet of Christ, that we would share the love that you place within us. Right now, just bow your heads for the next few minutes.
listen, I'm going to ask you to do something. Find a way that you can share the love of Jesus Christ with someone today. Make a difference. Thank you for watching today and thank you for being a part. If you don't have a church home, we'd love to have you here at Life Church. I know right now we don't even we don't even know what's going to happen next, but I do know this. That we'll be somewhere preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can share the love with our neighbors, our family, and our friends. Thank you for your consistency and your faithfulness to giving to those who have given online, to those who have mailed their tithe and their offering into the church. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you for your desire and your obedience and your faithfulness, not to a church, but to God. Thank you today. Listen, this is, this is where we stand. We're in this place, this place that we may call today Egypt. But I will tell you this, wherever we are, God has a purpose for the place we find ourselves. I love you. Thank you for watching today. May God richly bless you. If you have a need or a prayer request, don't forget, send us that and let us know. We'll pray for you. We'll do our best to try to care for any needs as we are capable of doing and we'll try to help you as much as possible. We want to be the church that God has called us to be. And even though circumstances try to tie our hands and keep us from it, that's what we're here for. God bless you. Listen, also don't forget, my wife told me and she, she wants me to remind everybody, don't forget, go to the website at 3 o'clock and join us with our scavenger hunt. It's going to be a lot of fun. Just change in the worry and let's have some fun. God bless you. I love you. Have a great day.